of a great family, and I want to win. Yes, Jose Abreu, you want to win. The White Sox weren't giving you opportunity to win, but now you're with the Houston Astros, who will give you a great opportunity to win. And Brett, what do you? What are his chances of winning with the Astros? Oh my gosh, what are his chances? They just went through the roof. I mean, his stock just went over the top. The Astros' odds in Vegas are actually now they are the favorite in Vegas to Ooh. win the World Series. They have jumped the Los Angeles Dodgers. This is a special um, after the show edition. It's actually another episode of Locked on Astros. Thank y'all for tuning in. We're going to talk about Jose Abreu. We're going to talk about Jeff Bagwell. We're going to talk about Jim Crane and this three-headed monster they have going on and who they will be talking about in the winter meetings. Let's talk about some free agency, baby. Hello and welcome to Locked on Astros, your daily Astros podcast. Here are your hosts, Eric the Man Heisman and Brett H-Town Wheelhouse Chansey. We are Locked On Houston Astros, and we hope that you join us for a daily Locked On Astros podcast. And as Astro Craig says, a doubleheader tonight, but we couldn't let it go by. There was a big deal today, Jose Abreu's press conference, and we got to talk about it. So when you're not talking about Jose Abreu, Brett, where can I find you at? They can find me at H Town Wheelhouse on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok. They can find me at Stroh's411 on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Always positive, always Stroh's. All right, guys, thank you for making Locked on Astros podcast your first listen every day, whether it's on YouTube, go and keep on subscribing, go and give us big fat like while you're at it and go and make us your first listen on Apple, Odyssey, Spotify, Google, wherever you listen to your podcast uh, tomorrow, you're going to have something to listen to on your way home from work, on your way to work, everything, and probably even at work, um, depending on if you get, um, if you have some free time tomorrow, but this was there is a whole bunch of juicy bits from this press conference. And Jose Abreu said that one of the reasons why he came to the Astros is he felt like it was, it's a family. It's a, the Astros are a family. He's probably, um, I was surprised that the Jim Crane said that Abreu broke out his phone and literally said, Oh, I have all the um, players on the Astros phone numbers. Oh, Jose Altuve. Here it is. Oh, um, Yuli Gurriel. Um, I don't know if he has his number, but um, also you have Kyle Tucker. Here's his number. And he um, that he literally has every Astros phone number. So for somebody who's played against the Astros for so many years to already have phone numbers, that's something you do at spring training. You don't you don't already have that. So that shows what type of individual Jose Abreu is. And yes, he's filling in some big shoes for Yuli Gurriel. He said that he respected Guriel and what he's meant for the Astros organization. He said they their paths didn't they uh, they didn't really cross paths a lot in Cuba, uh, but he respects what he is as a player. And yeah. he said he hopes that he uh, still has a job in uh, Major League Baseball. I, will it be with the Astros? I know Jim Crane says that uh, they are talking to his agents. And there are the talks about coming backs, but we need to see if Yuli is even open to the backup role or not being the everyday first baseman. Yeah, that is the thing. And we're and we're going to get to the Contreras thing and the Rosenthal thing later in the show. But one of the things I love about Abreu is if you just scour the internet for the White Sox communications department and you look at what he's done in the community, his work he's done with kids, what like he is the type of player that the Astros deserve to have. He's the right. type of player that deserves to be a part of this organization. He's a high character guy. Um, we haven't seen, I mean, the guy stayed healthy. And I think a guy like him, even, a, even late in his career, and I know you had mentioned to me that Keith Law slammed the Astros for spending too much. Well, you know what? Keith Law is going to slam the Astros. They could, they could literally save a baby from a burning building and Keith Law would find a way to destroy that narrative because wow. he just he hates he hates the Astros. Him, Jeff Passan, all these, all these like New York and LA schmucks. I'm sorry. That's what they are. They have nothing good to say about this team. The bottom line is the Astros just became the most dominating force in Major League Baseball 
off of a World Series, okay? Losing their general manager, Jeff Bagwell steps in. And I want to mention this. Jeff Bagwell said today that in 2017, he was having some issues in his life. He didn't go into details, but he said Jim Crane took him under his wing. And Jim Crane basically changed his life. And he said, Jim Crane is a great person. There's a lot of things Jim Crane does that people don't know about. We are literally in the golden era of baseball where Jeff freaking Bagwell, your childhood hero, Eric, is at the forefront of these decisions. And I love his mind. I love the way he thinks. I love the three-headed GM thing. I mean, look, why don't we just start a new trend? Why do we have to have a single GM? Why can't we have like assistant to the regional manager type of atmosphere, right? I just really love Jose Abreu being here. I think it's a great signing. I don't mind they overpaid. But again, we'll talk about some of these other moves later on. But there's there's a lot to talk about coming in these winter meetings, Eric. Yeah, uh, Jeff Bagwell was asked, uh, I forgot who asked him, but somebody asked him, well, is there any interest in you being the GM? And he kind of laughed it off and said, no, uh, I, that's not a job he's looking for. But he said that whatever the Astros are going to ask him to do, he'll do it. Right now, I believe he's the uh, he's uh, one of the directors of the community outreach program or something right now. That's his official title or something like that. But he actually flew to Miami to meet with Jose Abreu, with uh, Jim Crane and a couple other people. And he pitched the Astros. um, If you want to come to a winning organization, sign with the Astros. The Astros can get you to that World Series. The Astros can help you win. And so Abreu said that Crane was a a big instrumental piece in coming to Houston. He said that he was in constant contact with his agent trying to work out the deal. And um, and then also Bagwell basically selling him, selling him on the team aspect. And um, he already knew a lot of the players. I mean, I believe a couple years ago, um, I think – out uh, Abreu bought a breakfast for the Astros when they're in town. So, yes. but Bagwell said that uh, Abreu is the perfect fit for the Astros clubhouse clubhouse. And he's the perfect person to add to this Astros roster. And uh, if uh, chemistry does mean something in the locker room, and that's what I wrote about it in gallery sports. I'll talk about what you want me to talk about in a second, yeah. but um he said that chemistry does mean something, and uh, it's it's just good to see that while he may not be the GM, it's good to see a player a not he's not just he wasn't just a great player, but he was a quiet leader in the Astros clubhouse back in the day, and so for him to be have the owner's ear and say no, I don't think this would be a good decision is the reason why I don't know if we're going to see somebody like Cody Bellinger um, kind of uh, come to Houston just because of the, yeah, I think eventually it'll go away. They'll all become teammates and they'll forget about what happened, but it's just going to be really awkward at the beginning. But um, I have a little story to tell and I wrote an article for gallery sports today and I was going off a Chandler Rome tweet. I'm not going to even spread that uh, what Chandler Rome was uh, spreading but basically um bagwell said that baseball relies too much on analytics and not enough on the players that play the game and uh, rome was kind of pointing it to a different direction i'm not gonna go that direction but um i get a um email from my boss at gallery sports and he's like well eric i'm gonna have to take out that quote from bagwell because Bagwell called me and said that that was incorrect. And I, I'm like, oh, at first I'm like, okay. And I didn't think about it. Then 10 minutes later, I'm like, wait, Bagwell called you? Bagwell read my article? <laughs> He's like, oh, yeah. Um, the Astros uh, like to read our stuff. So I thought that was pretty cool. My childhood hero, a guy that I grew up watching, and the guy that made me an Astros fan read so- my article. So if you know Jeff Bagwell, if anybody listening is connected to Jeff Bagwell, show him this episode, tell him we want him to come on this show. I think he would be phenomenal. He's great in the booth. I mean, he does live TV. This is a cakewalk. But I want to I want to piggyback on why, you know, Jeff Bagwell being there is so great. And and here's some insight to who Jim Crane is, okay? Jim Crane is one of those people 
Um, my friend Mark White and I talk a lot about Jim Crane, and he always puts the right people in the right spots. He's a baseball guy, and he reminded me today. He said people forget that Jim's baseball background taught was taught by Robert Tompkins. He knows this game, and it, he's extremely competitive. Bagwell is saying these, these types of players respond to Baker, compassionate clubhouse where it's easier to root out problems with everything on the table. All big money decisions do go through the owner group, so it makes sense that if the deal can be made, that there was a thinking about it GM. Jim is all over it. He's a mover and a shaker, and he will pull the trigger himself if he wants to. If you're going to bet on the Houston Astros, since they're now the odds-on favorite to win the World Series in 2023, you need to go to betonline.net. Or if you want to bet on the Texans getting the first overall pick and who will they get, C.J. Stroud, or who will they go after for their quarterback of the future? Because they clearly don't have that right now. They barely have a future. Um, In next week's game, we won't even talk about that. I'm hearing it might not even be televised. But if you want to bet on anything going on in professional sports, amateur leagues, soccer, basketball, football, the USA versus Netherlands in the round of 16, you need to go to betonline.net. It is the fastest and easiest way to get your betting fix. So head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and the action. Bet online, y'all, that's where the game starts. All righty. If you're, if you're, uh, Bagwell had a pretty long post press conference and it's good to hear kind of his thoughts on things. And Bagwell actually said that Jose Abreu was their number one target. And you kind of heard somebody say, sources say that he was the number one target. But now we hear Bagwell come out and say, yeah, I think he's the number one target. Everybody out there is probably thinking, well, Aaron Judge or this player. But we thought we needed uh, Abreu to play first base. And so we went out and got him. Uh, I know that uh, a lot of people are saying, well, you overpaid for a third guy who would be 36. He'll, he'll play his final season with the Astros at 38. Having you learn your lesson with uh, Yuli Gurriel. Uh, will he be productive for all three years? Uh, market value for him was 12.7. Is his bat slowing down? I don't think that matters at this time. The Astros aren't looking for him to be a superstar. They're looking at him at being another piece to this puzzle. And uh, Abreu kind of mentioned the home runs in uh, his um, a press conference today. He said, I think a lot of fans were getting, uh, what's the word? Uh, I can't think of it, but he's uh, they're getting, um, they're, he, they're just getting used to him hitting 30 home runs every year, a spoiled, they're getting spoiled. I don't know why I couldn't think of spoiled, but they're getting spoiled with him hitting 30 home runs every year. And he said, I tried to give it to him, but I'm, I'm going to try to do it again, but I can't, I don't know if that's going to be the player I am. The player I am is going to be somebody who's going to go out there and uh, just play some good baseball. And I can do that with the Houston Astros. But I think that with him playing with the short porch and uh, left field, and I know uh, he's a right-handed hitter, but I think he's going to hit a lot of home runs into the Crawford boxes. So someone's asking, and um, I'll respond to what you're saying. Someone's saying, so so what they're wondering, Chris says, is, is if we get Contreras, where does Brantley fit? We'll talk about Contreras here in a second. So we're not ignoring that. Several of y'all are asking about that. But Abreu, again, 311 lifetime with runners in scoring position. This guy hits hits baseballs. And earlier, um, it was it was mentioned in the chat. Well, you know, um, Mr. Corona said we've had elite offenses and they've gone silent in the playoffs before. But we also didn't have Jose Abreu. I mean, if you look at projected numbers, like runs that he can produce with him in the lineup, the Astros get between forty and sixty, between forty and fifty something runs extra on the season just with Abreu in the lineup. And with the murderers row like that one through seven, Eric, look, this guy's a big body. He plays first base. He doesn't play outfield. He doesn't play third. He doesn't play short. Um, He plays first base. He's actually got some got some time at second base as well. If you look at his outs above average. And that was that was what I was looking at. Um, He's actually, I, I believe, plus one outs above average at at first where Yuli was, was a negative. And, and, you know, if, if I'm being truly honest, I don't see how Yuli fits in the picture unless he comes back purely as a utility platoon 
does not plan on playing every day, he's not going to be an everyday player. He's going to have to come with a major discount. And if he doesn't go here, I think he ends up in Miami to help them. Um, they have a strong Latin American force down there. Or if Yuli doesn't make it on any club, he could always slide into almost an advisory role. But I don't think Yuli in his mind is done playing. So he will be playing somewhere. Yeah. But this team, Eric, has a lot to look forward to. I, I, I love that Jim Crane says, look, we're pursuing an outfielder. We're pursuing a bat. We're pursuing catchers. And one of the guys that I really like, Eric, in left field, and I don't know what his price would be. I love Andrew Benatendi because, look, we have to wait and see with Michael Brantley. And Michael Brantley, I think this fits perfectly for the Astros. If he's not ready until after spring training or as spring training's getting, you know, you know, you know, coming to a close, that Michael Brantley signs here on a team-friendly deal because he loves it in Houston. He loves the clubhouse. He loves the atmosphere. He loves the culture. And I don't think anyone's going to want to pay him a whole lot coming off this type of shoulder surgery at his age. I think Brantley coming back is definitely a realistic possibility, more so, I think, than Yuli coming back. Uh, yeah, I would, I would agree with you. Um, I think... Uh, Brantley fills more of a role. Um, uh, we do see some of y'all's comments on YouTube, like after the show. I know a lot of people were, were having a conversation about how is um, Abreu's defense better than Yuli's defense. We were mostly talking yesterday about last year's defense. We we we're not arguing. Uh, Yuli Gurriel has been the better defender over the years. So there's an option that if you don't get another bat to play DH. Technically, you could bring back Yuli Gurriel to play first base and have Abreu be the DH. But Jeff Bagwell kind of came out today and squashed it. And he said, this is the Astros first baseman. And he was introducing him to a group of kids and said, this is your Astros first baseman. And mm -hmm. so uh, this, I think they're looking at him at first base. They believe in his abilities to do it. And the Astros, the people that run the Astros, or uh, even if they don't have a GM, they get paid a lot more than we do. They know a lot more about baseball than we do. So I just think that we need to just have the, the faith that they know what they're doing. But Yuli Gurriel, I think he's he filled his role for the Astros. And um, yes, he was awesome for the Astros in the playoffs. And uh, like I said yesterday, they could not have gone as far as they did last year without him. But um, at some point you've got to move on from a player and the Astros have decided to do that. So you asked about Andrew Benettini, uh, his market value. I don't know if you want to hear this, uh, but his market value is 17.3 million. And the contract that they're suggesting that he gets on sport track is six years. So that would be six years, 104 million. But don't, I don't you think though, but don't you think though, Eric, so a, a really quick counterpoint, the Astros with this going, like we are going for broke. We're going back to the world series. We're going to go back to back for the next two or three years. We're going to contend for the world series. Don't you think they could talk Ben attendee into a four year deal or three years with a club option in the fourth year? Would he take, I'm just asking, would he take a shortened deal to go on and win? Now he has won a world series. So he already has that under his belt with the Red Sox. Um, he's kind of, he, he did, he did decent in New York, but he could really flourish here with that, with that left field wall with, you know, the Crawford boxes and heck, we remember the catch he made that changed that series. It seemed like in 2018, when we thought if he would have missed that ball, that would have changed the whole series, but he's a really good defender. I do think his price is a little high. I, I just like his profile as a hitter where he where he would fit in the lineup yeah because here's the thing with the wilson Contreras thing and that's what we need to talk about is wilson Contreras is, is being talked about and ken rosenthal adam spolone is now reporting it whatever his last name is Spol Spol spoloni i don't know um adam you, you know what i'm talking about from from houston they're both saying that you know the astros will be meeting with wilson Contreras in the winter meetings but I'm going to tell you, I don't think the Astros 
need a Wilson Contreras because I don't think he's going to agree to just be a DH. I think he wants to catch. Maldi has that spot. You have him at $5 million. It's not expensive. You have Maldi's going to need to mentor Corey Lee or Yonder Diaz. I just don't see, I don't know, maybe maybe Contreras is cool with being a DH and that's really it because he's really not going to play catcher that much. I, I just, his price, I mean, Benatendi's price is high, but Contreras' price, isn't it going to be higher? Uh, for who? For Wilson Contreras. Uh, yeah, it's probably going to be high. I'll have to look at what Sportrack says about him. But um, I know that Ken Rosenthal wrote about him, and he said the Astros are planning to meet with him at the winter meetings, like you just said. And we all know that Jim Crane and Jeff Bagwell, Dusty Baker, whoever it was, nixed the deal at the trade deadline for Jose Arquiti for Contreras. And... Um, but it's a whole different situation. I know somebody in the chat earlier mentioned that, well, well, if they nix that trade now, why would they go out and get him now? Because instead of having to trade somebody that the Astros are going to rely on this year, uh, all it's going to cost is the second highest draft pick and 500000 from their international draft bonus pool. Granted, I know that's a big deal for the Astros, but if you're trying to build this ultimate fantasy team, you're going to go out and try to do this. And um, so the thing is Contreras can play left field. You can put him at the DH spot. I don't think the Astros are looking at him as a catcher. He did play left field a little bit um, in his rookie year with the, uh, with the Cubs. So that is an option. So you can kind of sw switch him back and forth with um, – Alvarez in left field, see how that goes in spring training, see if he's able to do that. Then you can also give him some starts at catcher. I think it would be actually a great addition to the Astros. I know that they want that extra left-handed bat, and honestly, I think I want that as well. But um, it really depends on the price tag uh, because if um, I'm – we can throw all the money we want at, at Andrew Benettini, Wilson Contreras – but what happens, I know that uh, Chandler Rome the other day said that the Astros already tried to make a deal with Kyle Tucker, and Kyle Tucker said, no, I, I want a little bit more or uh, declined the deal. But if you're throwing all these monies, like long-term six-year deal for Andrew Benettini, that's going to eat into some of the money you could be paying Kyle Tucker. So um, definitely something to situate. So, yeah, I know that uh, Ken Rosenthal said that uh, he's the Astros aren't looking for him as a catcher, but he okay. still could catch. Okay, I wasn't sure. okay. Yeah, I hadn't I hadn't read the article. You just you just mentioned, you know, for those of y'all listening, Eric just mentioned the article. The article actually had been written. We were we were on air and um, he sent it to me. So I, I haven't had a chance to look at it. Um but you know, I like what Mr. Cronus says. I want a legit left fielder. I don't, I don't, I don't want a guy who 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 just slot in. Okay, um, Ben Attendee, Corey Dickerson. Um, you know, you you've got other left-handed bats out there that are more budget-minded bats. Heck, what about Kevin Kiermaier? I know he's a center fielder, but put him in left field. I mean, th there are there are players out there that are left-handed batters that are a little long in the tooth when it comes to baseball age, but you don't have to break the bank. And the bottom line is this, wait, hold on. Why are we talking left field? Jordan Alvarez is our left fielder, isn't he? Uh, yes. But Je Jeff Bagwell kind of mentioned today that they were, they're kind of looking at upgrading and left field because they would like to uh, have Alvarez out there for about 45, 50% of the time because he likes uh, being on the field. So uh, maybe they're not looking at him as being a full-time DH. And part of the, uh, what Jim Crane said is that they would like to upgrade at catcher, another outfielder. And he says, you can never have enough uh, pitching. And I think they meant starting pitching most likely, especially if Justin Verlander does go to Dodgers with uh, John Morosi says is the most likely destination at this point. So a famous person once told me, Eric, the man Heisman said, you can never have too many pitchers. <laughs> Remember you and I were having this conversation mm -hmm. and I was like, what do we need seven starters for? And we had like nine on the season. Hey, look, I'm willing to admit when I'm wrong. You know, that's, that's what I think separates myself from a lot of people is, is look, I can eat my crow. Okay. 
And look, you know, just 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 to go off some other things too. There are some other like really high price options that I think are too high price. The Nemos and guys like that. We we've got to realize that Chas McCormick has absolutely earned his spot in center field, Eric. And I believe that center field is his. Um, but there are so many things to talk about. I mean, like Kyle Tucker, like how much is this guy going to get paid? Because let me tell you something about Kyle Tucker that I love. This kid is so quiet, Eric. Okay, I'm going to go off a little bit, just a bit of a tangent. Kyle Tucker knows that he's one bad A MFer. That dude knows how good he is. And the Astros, and I've always been like, don't sign him early, don't sign him early. You need to sign this guy as quickly as you can because the longer he plays, the more games he gets under his belt without a shift, his value is going to go through the roof. And this kid's from Tampa, and he knows his crap doesn't stink. And he has a quiet confidence about him. He's not real flashy, but I think deep down inside, he knows who he is. He knows what he's got going for him. He is, I think, the best right fielder in the game. And yes, I know Aaron Judge just won the MVP, but Kyle Tucker has not even given us everything he can give us. All righty. I'm um, going back to Wilson Contreras. Um, his market value right now is 16.4 uh, and he's uh, projected to get possibly a four year deal. So that's about sixty five point six million dollars. So that is the issue that the Astros have to think about. So if you're going to pay him that much, um, you would like it to be more of it than just a occasional left fielder more than it's just a DH, but he can offer some offense. This is something that a lot of the potential DHs out there cannot do. It's just a matter of can Wilson Contreras take that mental step back and be like, okay, I'm not going to catch every day. I'm just going to be DH. I'm just going to maybe sometimes play left field when Alvarez wants to take a, get it or Baker wants to rest Alvarez's knees. But I think that Contreras is more likely to be signed by the Astros than you think he is because the Astros want him. And the Astros have this knack of when they want a guy, they go get their guy. They do, but they haven't given a deal more than six or seven years and over, you know, 100, 150 million dollars. So I mean, they do, but they Contreras don't. is not going to take a six year deal. He will take a three to four year deal. That's true. Okay, so so if if you get them on a shorter deal, look, the bottom line is this: we don't know what the hell they're going to do. I mean, that is what the mystery is. What we're trying to figure out is what's best for this team long term. Okay, because if you pay, like you've paid Abreu, okay, you paid over his over his value on Spotrack. Okay, I don't know if Spotrack is the end all be all. It's not biblical. It's just estimate. But it's yeah. it's one of the only sites to really go to. If there's other sites, I would like to know because I haven't seen them. The bottom line is this, and I talked to you about this. I don't know if it was off the air or during the show. Actually, it was off the air. Jim Crane is absolutely throttling the major leagues right now. He's still upset that they forced his hand on letting on on forcing him to get rid of AJ Hinch and Jeff Luno. And he's still pissed about losing those draft picks. Now, I haven't had conversations with Crane, but I know that he loved this World Series championship because now his brand has a legitimate title that people can't say anything about. And do you think he, a billionaire, is happy with one title? Absolutely freaking lutely not. This is the Bulls of the 90s. This is the Patriots run with Tom Brady. This is the San Francisco 49ers of the 80s. This is a dynasty, Eric. This is a team that will continue to crush the competition. And we just signed a former MVP. So think about that, Major League Baseball, because when you go to sleep, the nightmares you have will be the Astros beating you, getting to another World Series. Yeah, so definitely I think the Astros are one more player away from being a dynamite team, a team that can just uh, not sleepwalk to the World Series, but th they could have the lineup that will just uh, do that. And so I know that uh, one of the things that Astros fans would like to hear about from the press conference today is that yeah. Jim Crane did say that they do have the resources, a.k.a. the money – 
to go to the at the luxury tax threshold or past the luxury ta tax threshold. Spend that money. It's not ours, Eric, right? Jim Crane, spend that money. There you go. Sorry. Yeah. So definitely, um, definitely something to look at. It's um, something to kind of think about is like, what can the Astros do from here? If Justin Verlander is going somewhere else, we can um, decide what to do from um, there. But I don't think the Astros truly need him. If Hunter Brown is the future, give him a chance now. And uh, then you can decide, are you going to go with six-man rotation so you can keep Jose Arquiti fresh and just go with the dynamic bullpen you have? So, uh, But I still think that the Astros will sign a veteran starter, um, somebody to – maybe have as a loan reliever or something. I think the Astros still have two, two more signings, two uh, impact signings before spring training happens, before they even get their a GM, which Jim Crane basically came out today and said, yeah, uh, I've already told y'all, but he didn't say it like that. But he said, I'm not going to hire a GM until um, January. Yeah. He said they, they've starting to compile some candidates. And so I'm sure they're going to be using December to kind of start looking at those candidates. But uh, the winter meetings should be very interesting. Not only uh, could the Astros lose Corey Jolks, he's one of the guys that uh, could be going in a Rule 5 draft, but the Astros could be looking at maybe adding some other players. There's some interesting names out there. But at the same time, would you really, on a championship roster, would you really go with Rule 5 guy? I don't think so. And if the Wilson Contreras talks are true, that would be awesome to go there without a DH and come back with a DH. So that would be a cool situation. So there's so much coming up. Yeah, um, there is. Yeah. So, you know, Michael Conforto is, you know, another guy that you you have mentioned before that we know the Astros have talked to. But this this is an interesting point. I was and I was thinking about this. The Astros are doing what the Los Angeles Dodgers, the New York Mets and the New York Yankees have done. They're going out and they're starting to sign big free agents to contracts to bring them here. Right. Contracts mm -hmm. that fit their ball club. But the difference between what the Astros do and what everybody else has done and failed at is they've kept their core together. They've been able to keep this core together, even in light of losing Correa, even in light of losing Springer. You still have a core group of guys that is the foundation of this ball club. And that is a culture. That is a, when you create a workplace environment like the Astros have on the field, off the field, in the clubhouse, that is hard to replicate. And that's why the Astros separate themselves from the rest of the pack because they are doing the things that the other clubs do because when they signed a Brayu, the world was pissed. The non Astros world was like, what? Hold on. That's not fair. They're already really good. Yeah. They just got better. And I like our chances in 2023, Eric. Yeah, somebody asked if Andrew Benettini can play left field. I mean, sorry, center field. Yes, he can play center field. He's actually played uh, every outfield position. So but he's why are you replacing Chaz McCormick? He deserves it, and he's a fraction uh, of the cost. Why are you talking like this? Because you're not going to put Benettini in center field. They're just asking. I know. <laughs> Oh, are you going to finish the show like this? Are you a ventriloquist now? <laughs> Eric has a hand puppet <laughs> trying to be a ventriloquist. Uh, what is going and on? This is what Benettini had an OPS guy. plus last year of 120. So uh, he is um, he is a above average player. He is somebody who is only, what, 28 years old. Um, so I think that he would be asset. I would like to see more than five home runs, but um he does have a good batting average. He does have a good on base percentage and his OPS is not bad for somebody with only five home runs at 772. So I think there's a potential there. Uh, it just depends on how much the Astros would have to pay to get him away from the Yankees and, or just get him away from any other team. Cause as we saw the uh, guardians were trying to sign Jose Abreu and also uh, apparently the um, Abreu said the white Sox made him a very good offer, but he's just going to leave it at that. 
He's like, I'm tired of losing. <laughs> He's like Barry Sanders. He did not I'm say that. Tired. I want to go on record and say he did not say that. But <laughs> No, but he pretty much implied it, okay? It's, yeah, it's, it's implied in his – because, dude, the White Sox did that. See? They brought in big free agents, and what did it right. do? Didn't do anything for them. Of course, you know, in their defense, those guys were injured all season long. But, look, the Dodgers are, are going to do it again with Justin Verlander. How amazing would this be, Eric? We'll wrap this up here. Would it be Astros, Dodgers, 2023 World Series, the Astros beat Justin Verlander in a World Series clinching game? I'm done. All right. So this is H-Town Wheelhouse with Locked on Astros. He is Eric the Man Heisman. He's over there on that side. Thank you all for tuning in. This is a second show in a night. Um, we love it. We love you guys hanging out, and we hope that you listen to us on Apple, Google, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts on your way to work, on your way home from work, whether you're traveling, on the road, whatever's going on. And after you make us your first listen, make sure you make Locked On Sports your second listen. That's right. Check out Locked On Sports today. It's the biggest stories of the day, plus instant reactions, big game recaps, and the take of the day you won't want to miss. Available on the Odyssey app, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. For myself and Eric Van Heisman, y'all have a good one and... Let's sign Wilson Contreras. Oh. <laughs>